But today is a good day. It's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. Let's stand and sing about what a glorious day it is and what a glorious day it will be when we see Jesus. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and the light shined
pray. Father, thank you so very much for this day, this glorious day that we celebrate what you did for us on the cross. How you lived, you died, you were buried and rose again to pay the price for our sins, to set us free from death and from hell and from the grave and from Satan and from all his power. And Lord, we give you thanks and honor and glory for we love you so because of what you've done for us. Lord, I pray that your hand will be upon us today, that you will lead us, that you will speak to us, that you will show us your truth, and that you will show us the hope that we have for this life in Jesus. And not only the hope that we have, but the purpose that we have. We were created specifically by you in a specific way for a specific purpose all according to your plan. Father, help us to find that plan, to follow that plan, to surrender ourselves to your plan and your will and not try to do things our own way. Because when we go our own way, we always, always make a mess of it. So Father, help us today to love you, to honor you, to worship you, to obey you, to listen to you and to hear what you say. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Go ahead and be seated. They've got them distributed now. Uh, I got a phone call this last week from a lady, and she said, do you have any Operation Christmas Child boxes to give? And I said, well, what do you mean? What do you need? I wasn't sure if she was asking for filled boxes or empty boxes or just what. And she said, well, we've been collecting things all year, but we forgot to order our boxes. And we need about 20 boxes. Do you have those? And I said, yes, we do. Because we had boxes left. We had some extra boxes that they had given us just in case we needed them for any purpose. And we had 22 boxes. And I said, we got 20 boxes for you. She said, great, I'll be there in 15 minutes. And when I gave them to her, I said, now, there's just one catch. When you get these all filled, you got to bring them back here. <laughs> she said, oh, we will. So I'm looking forward to that. Operation Christmas Child, Thanksgiving, Christmas. It's all just running downhill full speed ahead. But for today, let's put those aside and let's worship our Lord. Let's stand, let's sing about Jesus.
Moving from being lost to being found. Moving from not being a follower of Jesus to becoming a follower of Jesus. As I talked about last week, when you become a follower of Jesus, the old has passed away and behold, something new has come. At 2 Corinthians 5.17. Regeneration, rebirth, born again. You are something new. But it doesn't stop there. Just like when a baby is born, that's not the end of the story. That's just the beginning of the story for the baby. And so we have justification, which is Jesus paid the price for our sins. And we look out and... We look at God and we have that personal relationship with him that's made possible through Jesus. You see, because of sin, God cannot have sin in his presence. God is holy and he cannot abide sin. So if we on our own go to God, he looks at us and he sees our sin. But when we have Jesus and his blood has covered us, his blood covers our sin, atones for our sin, then when, G, when God looks at us, when we come to him, he sees the blood of Jesus and we are justified by faith in Jesus. Therefore, he sees not our sin, but the work of his son, Jesus. And so we are justified. And then the process of sanctification just means growing and maturing in our walk with Christ. And then... Glorification is what happens when we receive our heavenly rewards, when we pass from this life to the next. And we are called to sanctification. We are called to sanctification. This is part of our calling as a Christian, a calling to sanctification, to grow and to mature constantly in our walk with Jesus, day after day after day. And how do we do this? You should know where I'm going with this by now. By reading our Bibles and by praying. You should be reading your Bible regularly, consistently. You should be praying regularly, consistently, and not just at mealtime. But you should have consistent prayer time. Talking with God. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says, For God has not called us to impurity, he hasn't called us to sin, but to sanctification. We've been called as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, to sanctification. We talked a little bit the last couple of weeks about holiness and how holiness makes us uncomfortable. Holiness makes other people uncomfortable. But living the holy life that God has designed for us and God commands us and God calls us to, that is a life of building and growing in sanctification. And that's a life that's different. That's a life that stands out. We are called. This, this next one shouldn't catch anybody by surprise. Because we've spent a few weeks on it recently. We are called to take up our cross. We are called to take up our cross. Luke 9.23. Jesus said if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself daily, take up his cross, and follow me. This verse can be summed up in, it's not about you, it's about Jesus. Therefore, by denying yourself, sacrificing yourself, your desires, your wants, your whatever it is, for the betterment of Jesus, to follow Jesus, to obey him, to build his kingdom. That's what it means. We're called to sanctification. We're called to take up our cross. We're called to follow him. Following Jesus is the number one priority of anyone who is a follower of Jesus. That is number one on the list. And number two, you have to turn a bunch of pages before you can get to a number two. Because following Jesus is number one and that's about, that's basically it. If you do that, anything else on your list will be taken care of.
following Jesus. This is the calling. This is the most important calling that we have. Are you living a life that is worthy of the calling of following Jesus? Does your language show it? Do your actions show it? Does your lifestyle show it? Does your work ethic show it? In all of these areas and so many more, do they show you're a follower of Jesus or do, you sh do they show you're following the world, you're following the crowd, you're following yourself? That's what you have to determine. I can't determine it for you. But look at the Word of God. Look at your life. And if they match and mesh well, you're on the right track. If they don't match, if they don't mesh, you're wrong. It's just that simple. And I'm sorry if that bothers someone, whether you're here this morning or watching on Facebook or on TV. I'm sorry if my saying you're wrong offends you, but don't take it up with me. Take it up with God. He's the one that said it. He sets the standards. He says you meet these standards or you don't. You meet these standards, everything's fine. You don't, you're wrong. He makes it very easy, very simple. But the calling, your calling as a Christian is not the only calling that you have. It is the first and it is the most important calling. But you also have a calling as a family member. I want to talk briefly about your calling as a family member. As a parent, a spouse, a child, a grandchild, grandparent, or any other relationship. You have responsibilities you must fulfill. So the question is, are you fulfilling them? Are you doing them properly? Are you doing it completely? Are you living worthy of your calling as a family member? Are you pulling your weight in the family? If one of your responsibilities is mowing the yard, and it takes two weeks and four beatings to get you out there to mow the yard, you're not pulling your weight. You're not fulfilling your calling as a family member. If your calling as a family member, if part of your responsibility is to wax the kitchen floor or paint the roof or whatever, and you're not doing it, or you're not doing it properly, or you have to be forced to do it, you're not pulling your weight as a family member. I want to talk briefly about some of the specific roles in families and their responsibilities. I want to talk first about spouses. Spouses, you have responsibilities to each other. According to Scripture, according to God's Word, after Jesus, the most important responsibility, the most important relationship in your life is to be to your spouse. Not to your parents, not to your children, but to your spouse. These responsibilities make you important in your relationship. And it makes your spouse important. Do not take them for granted. Do not overlook them. Men are to be the spiritual head of the household. If there is not a man... Women, you've got to fill the role because there is no one. Men, if you are in a household, and if you're here or you're watching live or on TV, if you're, if you're a man, this is your responsibility, according to God's Word. And you have a huge impact on the spiritual life of your family no matter what you do. If you take this responsibility seriously, and you lead them in prayer. And you lead them in study. And you make sure that you're in church. And you make sure that they're learning about the things of God. And your children are learning about the things of God. Then that will have a huge impact on their spiritual lives. And if you reject your responsibility and you do nothing and you don't care about church and you don't 
care if the kids go to church or if the, your wife goes to church or you try to plan things on Sundays specifically to keep folks out of church and all of this, well, that will have an incredibly powerful impact on your family's spiritual life as well. You have a huge responsibility. You have been given your home. Spouses, you have a home together. You have been given your home by God. <clears throat> You've been given your home by God. And God expects much from you. You've got to do your very best. Parents, spouses, oftentimes you become parents. Hopefully that's the way it goes. That's the way it's supposed to go. Spouse first, then parent. We have a lot in our world today that are doing things backwards. They're having lots and lots of children. One, two, three, four, five, eight, twelve, however many. And then years later they decide to get married. That's not the way God says to do it. You have responsibilities to your children. Responsibility number one, parent, is to love your children un <clears throat> excuse me, unconditionally. You love them completely. You love them totally. You love them unconditionally. Now, they may do things you don't like. And they may do things when and you say, I don't like that. I don't like how you're acting. I don't like what you're doing. I don't like what you're saying. But I still love you. There's a huge disconnect if you tie your liking of your children and your love to your children together. That's a huge disconnect. Because then your children will live their life in fear of losing your love. They'll be scared to do anything. Because if they make a wrong choice, you won't love them. No, you love your children unconditionally. Absolutely, totally, fully, unconditionally. And parents... I know this is hard. This can be hard. But do not show favoritism. If you've been watching the Bible studies that I'm leading online, Wednesdays at 11, we've been going through recently, we're going through Genesis, and we've recently, a few weeks back, talked about Jacob and Esau. And we saw how Isaac had a favorite in Esau, and Rebekah had a favorite in Jacob and their favoritism led to all kinds of problems and it can led to all kinds of issues and it, it took sibling rivalry to a whole other level parents do you know what causes sibling rivalry having more than one kid it's just that, that that's it if you have more than one kid, you're going to have sibling rivalry at some point, in some way. But do not show favoritism. Isaac and Rebekah had favorites, and they didn't even try to hide it, hide it. It led to all sorts of problems and issues between the boys and between the children and their parents led to all sorts of problems. So don't show favoritism. Children, let me talk to you for a moment. Children, you have responsibilities to your parents. Number one responsibility, obey. Obey your parents. That's your number one responsibility. Number two is to respect your parents. I don't know if he remembers this or not, but the day my son turned 13 years old, I took him and sat him down, and I said, you're a teenager now. And a lot of kids start acting up when they become teenagers. They start acting rude and disrespectful towards their parents and things like this. I said, I want to talk to you about two Bible verses. And those of you that are parents with young children, you may want to write these down. They'll come in very handy someday. Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, verse 15 and verse 17. 
One of them says, he who strikes his father or mother shall be put to death. And the other one says, he who curses his father or mother shall be put to death. And I just looked at him and I said, son, you know we believe in doing what the Bible says. And to our faces, we never had any problems. Behind our back, that's probably something totally different. But I look at my son, he goes, <laughs> he's not saying a word. That's okay. Children, you've got to obey and respect your parents. I tell you what, we'd have a lot fewer teenagers in gangs, being delinquents, causing problems, breaking laws, strung out on drugs, if we took those two verses and enforced them. We'd also have a lot fewer teenagers around and a lot fewer adults because they wouldn't have survived out of their teens. But it's about obedience and respect. And grandparents have a whole other set of responsibilities. Grandparents have responsibilities as family members. You're calling as a family member. First of all, and I know this, is, this, this rubs some of you the wrong way, but the number one thing I see is you need to support the parents of your grandchildren. I watched my grandson the other day and for several hours and I wasn't really sure what all we were going to do and I thought you know something that would be really easy that would keep him entertained keep him out of trouble I'd sit him on the floor and just take a five pound bag of M&Ms and dump them out right in front of him that would keep him you know entertained for hours probably but I also know that they would not have approved the parents would not have approved of that approach so I didn't do that What? It was just a three pound. <laughs> <laughs> Support the parents. They have the responsibility of raising the children. God has given the children to them. God gave you your children. You did your best with them. Now let your children do their best with your grandchildren. I saw it said one time about grandparents. If you raised your children right, you get to enjoy your grandchildren. If you enjoyed your children, you get to raise your grandchildren. Because what that means is if you just had fun with your kids and you didn't parent them properly, then your grandchildren are going to be out of control and you're going to have to try to fix that. But grandparents support the parents and help the grandchildren. Help the grandchildren. And that can mean anything. They might, depending on their ages and their activities and all of this, support them, show up, talk to them, help them with homework if they need it, help them with special projects. Just take them if you can. I know some of you are separated from your grandchildren by hundreds of miles. That's a totally different thing. But with the internet and all, you can talk to them constantly. And you can contact them and say, they can say, hey, I, uh, I'm having trouble with my history. Th th this would be a typical, let's say, third grader. Okay? Grandma, I'm having trouble with history, and I know you lived through most of it, so would you help me with? <laughs> that would be very typical. So help them, if you can. We have callings as family members. We have callings as family members within our church family. We'll get into those another time. But I wanted to talk about our family callings and are you living worthy of your calling of being a member of your family are you living worthy of the calling that God has given you because God gave you this calling when he put you within your family he said you belong here now I know some of you come from very 
bad family situations. And I'm so sorry for that. I know some of you have families that take all the fun out of dysfunction. I grew up in a family that put the fun into dysfunction. But some of you are in a horrible situation. You grew up in a horrible situation. And I'm sorry, and all I can say is, you cannot let your past define the choices you make today. You still have options to make good choices, to make powerful choices, to make correct choices, if you follow the leading of Jesus. It's about the choices you make today, not what you experienced 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 30 years ago. If you grew up where you were abused, neglected, beaten, mistreated, whatever it was, I'm sorry. But that does not need to define your choices today. They're still right, they're still wrong, they're still good, they're still best. Follow God to make those best choices and best decisions. I want to move on to one more calling that we have as Christians. And that's our calling as an employee. Do your job well. As an employee, do your job well. <clears throat> you really and truly... Now, if there are multiple followers of God in your workplace, then this could be a fun challenge for you. But you should be the best employee, the best worker that they have. You should be the best worker that they have. Ephesians 6, Paul's talking here in Ephesians 6, verse 6. And he's talking about how you do all things. Not for man, but for God. You're not working for your boss. You're not working for your supervisor. You're not working for your paycheck. You're working for God. God gave you that job. Do your best for Him. You shouldn't be slacking off. You shouldn't be taking shortcuts. I have been considered one of the best employees everywhere I've worked, just about. Uh, I want to tell you just one little brief story. I was working at McDonald's while I was in school. I was working breakfast, and I was had finally given in. I'd had three different managers ask me to become a shift supervisor, a shift manager. And I told them all no, because to do so, they wanted me to basically drop out of school and work for them and I wouldn't do that. I finally had one that said, I'm not asking you to change your schedule. I want you to be my breakfast manager the three days a week that you work. You're working the schedule, just keep working the same schedule, but if you'll be my breakfast manager, then I know that at least three days a week I don't have to worry about anything until I get in. And so I agreed. And I was doing all the things that I was supposed to do, and we had a girl that was hired. She was fairly new and one day she was working in the drive through window, taking orders, paying, you know, making change, all of this stuff. And when it was time for her to go on break, I stepped in, worked her window, worked her computer and her register for about 15 minutes and then we switched back. And when her drawer was counted out at the end of the day. She was short about $300. And, of course, they had a security camera in there that took pictures of her taking the money. <clears throat> but she was asked about it. And she said, well, I don't know. I didn't take the money. And she said, well, when I went on break, Todd worked in there. So he must have been the one to take the money. At which point, the manager of the store began laughing in her face so hard she had to sit down and she said, you know, if you had accused me of stealing the money, I would be more likely to believe you than if you accused Todd of stealing. The one person you could not accuse of stealing from around here is him. 
because I know him. I'd worked for him for over three years by this point. They, she knew me very well. She knows he is the most honest person that I have ever met. And by the way, um, you won't be getting any paycheck until you've paid us back the money that you took. You should be the best worker. You should be well regarded. You should do more than is expected of you and more than you're paid for. And I know that goes against a lot of our culture today. They say, if you're not getting paid for it, don't do it. Just do the bare minimum to get by. That's not what God says to do. He says, do your very, very best. Your calling from God as a follower of Jesus involves more than just living a good moral life. Your calling requires that you find and know God and know what He wants from you and how He's calling you to grow as a Christian, to grow as a family member, to grow as an employee. <clears throat> Your calling from God as a follower of Jesus is more than just living a moral life. You're called to be high quality people as family members, employees, and more that we're going to look at next week. As we prepare to go today, I want to challenge you to walk worthy of your calling. Walk worthy of your calling. Remember, Ephesians 6.6, 6, all things you do as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from your heart. That's more than just, your calling is more than just living a good moral life. It's doing everything for God. It is doing everything God's way. Will you take more seriously your calling from God as a Christian? <coughs> Bless you. Maybe you will spend, be willing to spend more time reading the Bible, praying, getting to know God, serving Him. <clears throat> if you're looking for places to serve Him, we do have the OCC collection coming up in a couple weeks. It's actually, it starts next week on the 16th. And so, are you willing to serve? Are you willing to be serious about your calling? Are you willing to take your calling as a family member more seriously? Whether you're a child, a spouse, a parent, a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, a whoever. Are you willing to take it seriously? Are you willing to do what you must to become who God created you to be and who He has called you to be? Are you ready to be more serious about following Jesus? You're not getting any younger, as my mother used to say. Don't waste any more time. You don't know how much longer you have to get serious about following Jesus. So I want to challenge you. Do it today. If you have questions, if you want to know more about what I'm talking about, ask questions. Write it, if you're here today, write it on your communication card, drop it in the offering plate. If you are watching on Facebook, drop us a line, a comment, or a personal message. Either way, and I'll get right back to you as soon as I can. <clears throat> if you're watching on TV, email us. The email address is at the end of this program. Or you can call us. The phone number's at the end also. You can look us up. But we're here and I want to answer your questions. I want to help you become more serious about following Jesus. Maybe you need my help. Maybe you need a little bit of help or guidance in becoming a follower of Jesus for the first time. Let me know. I'll be glad to help you and talk to you about 
Are you willing to get serious about who God called you to be? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so very much for this day and time. Thank you for the calling that you have given us. Thank you also, Lord, for the warning from Scripture that says, <clears throat> from those who have been given much, much more will be expected. And you have given each and every one of us a lot. You have blessed us in mighty ways. You have blessed us with so much. So help us, Lord. Help us to meet your expectations. Help us to know you. And to be serious about the calling that you have placed upon our lives. Help us to take it seriously and to live it out. Throughout the entire process of growing and maturing. The whole process of sanctification. And through it all, hold our hands Lead us and guide us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.